Greetings and peace to you. I hope you are well and in good health, of a sober mind, and in spiritual equilibrium. Today, we will continue our exploration of Fire Within by the excellent Father Thomas Dubay. This is Chapter 5, What is Contemplation, Part B. We had to bifurcate because of a lack of time on my part, and I determined that after 35 minutes, much information had already been given. But now, thanks be to God, we can continue our recitation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Om Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made. To fill the hearts which thou hast made. Fire Within, Chapter 5, What is Contemplation, Part B, Biblical Formulations. One of the most extravagant errors of recent decades among religious men and women is the idea that contemplation is a monastic enterprise, good in itself, but the exclusive domain of the cloister. Otherwise, intelligent people have argued that because contemplation is a matter for monks and nuns alone, religious in the active apostolates should not even include references to it in their rules, much less expect to experience it in their own prayer life. And, of course, even less so are laymen and laywomen to be bothering their heads about it. Apparently, they have not considered that the real question is not whether contemplation is an occupation proper to secluded life, but whether it is a gospel reality and thus meant for all men and women in every vocation. While it is true that the scriptures do not speak of contemplation in terms that Plato or Aristotle used, it is decidedly untrue that the inspired word did not know and recommend the reality. A deep communion with God, and our Christic contemplation is nothing other than a love communion of increasing depth, is found repeatedly in the pages of both the Old and New Testaments. The evidence so abounds that we shall here present only a representative sampling of it. Anyone who has read widely in the mystics knows well that these greatest of our contemplatives found endless nourishment for their advanced prayer in the inspired word. Unworded Prayer We may commence our sketch of contemplation in Scripture by noting that biblical men and women were well aware that there is a prayer that surpasses mere vocalization. The psalmist's heart and flesh sing for very joy to the living God, and he wishes at times simply to be still and know that the Lord is God indeed. While Jesus warns us not to babble with many words as the pagans do when they pray, he himself spends whole nights absorbed in the Father. It is unlikely that he spent 10 to 12 hours uttering words. There is, therefore, a non-verbalized kind of prayer, a prayer that is quiet, still, inner and deep, a prayer very much like our above descriptions 
from Teresa and John. Experience of God So routine did the ancient Hebrews consider a vibrant experience of Yahweh that their expressions for knowing him did not mean merely the intellectual grasp that our current concept of knowing implies. A man knew his wife in sexual intercourse, that is, he experienced her deeply in becoming one flesh with her. The Hebrew knew God intellectually, of course, but his contact was not via sterile concepts. The psalmist invites everyone to taste and drink deeply, to experience for themselves how good the Lord is. They who look to him encounter him intimately and become radiant with joy. This is not merely vocal prayer or discursive reflection. It is a profound communion that puts one in touch with the living Lord. St. Peter shares this experiential thrill when he tells his new Christians that though they have not seen the risen Jesus, they have a joy in him so great that it cannot be described. St. Paul wants nothing other than knowing, that is, experiencing Christ and the power of his resurrection together with a sharing in his passion and death. Mystic Paul, likewise, admonishes his disciples that they are to imitate him as he imitates Christ. Once again, we find in the inspired word the very same reality spoken of by our two Carmelite saints. Contemplative Light Knowing Biblical men knew remarkably well in their own fashion, what we now call the co-natural, non-conceptual element in Christic contemplation. The psalmist declares that the one thing, the overriding necessity of all human life, is to gaze on the beauty of the Lord in his temple, that we are to keep our eyes always on the Lord, an astonishing idea when one ponders what it says and does not dilute its radicality. Indeed, if we keep Yahweh always before our eyes, nothing can shake us. So strongly does the holy person cling to God that he looks to no one else either in heaven or on earth. He is content to pause a while and imbibe the idea that God is indeed God. So crucial is this deep knowledge of the Lord that contemplation is said to be the very reward of living a virtuous life. Upright men will gaze upon his face, that is, will live in his presence. Centered as they are on God, prayerful people spend the whole night in vigil as they ponder the divine name. And they find that as the Lord's word unfolds, it gives them the light that the simple understand. In the new dispensation, the mother of the Lord is presented as the model of pondering the word in one's heart. And the other Mary, sitting on the floor, undividedly drinking the incarnate word, is the very picture of what contemplation means. St. Paul prayed for the Colossians that God would give them a perfect wisdom and spiritual understanding that they might possess the fullest knowledge of his will. Both the Old and the New Testaments, therefore, clearly describe the lofty knowing elements we now associate with infused contemplation, both in its initial stages and in its advanced developments that we are not reading an alien idea into Scripture can readily be seen by a simple comparison of the formulations of Teresa and John with the biblical expressions. Simple gazing on the divine beauty. 
continual keeping of one's attention on the Lord, looking to no one else, pausing and resting in the sacred presence, awareness of him through the night, light-giving pondering, perfect wisdom, spiritual understanding, fullest knowledge. Our two saints simply accentuate, elucidate, and illustrate what we already have in the divine word. Infused love. The greatest of all the commandments is before all else a prayer commandment. To have one's whole heart, soul, and mind filled to overflowing with the love of God is to be filled with the highest prayer. The core and essence of the transforming union are nothing other than a complete identification with God in love. When one walks lovesick for God, as St. John of the Cross puts it, he is at the heights of prayer life, and he is fulfilling the greatest commandment to perfection. This spiritual marriage of the soul with God is celebrated in the whole book of the Song of Psalms, and it is no wonder that mystics for the last twenty centuries have gravitated to the Song of Songs to explain mystical contemplation. This love, says St. Paul, is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Love poured out is, of course, infused love. The two words mean the same thing. The psalmist who declares that he delights in nothing else on earth but his Lord further proclaims that his flesh and his heart are pining with love, that his joy is to be near God. So advanced a love could not be anything but the burning infusions of which Teresa and John commonly speak. Deep Delight and Peace The reader will recall that both in St. Teresa's description of the prayer of quiet and in St. John's brief characterization of advancing infused prayer, there was a frequent emphasis on the dimension of a divinely bestowed delight, one that is not the result of discursive meditation. Scripture, too, commonly speaks of the same delight in God, a delight that surpasses emotion, even though an emotional resonance may accompany the essential spiritual joy. The psalmist shouts that his heart exalts and his soul rejoices in God, who is before him always. Nothing can unsettle this singer to the Lord, and he knows that he will have unbounded joy in the divine presence, everlasting pleasures at his right hand. St. Paul admonishes the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always and to experience a peace that is beyond all understanding. The infusion of divinely given strength, says Paul, comes from God's own glorious power, and it enables us to endure anything joyfully. All this is exactly what the mystics say of their experiences at prayer. Dry desire, ardent yearning. Not all contemplative prayer is sheer delight, Anyone who has seriously pursued a prayer life and the gospel lifestyle that is a prerequisite for it to flourish knows well enough that in the contemplative nights so vividly described by St. John of the Cross, one must encounter a vast inner void. A dry, empty feeling, yearning, is also part and parcel of this pilgrim enterprise. Scripture likewise knows of it 
and often returns to the theme of an arid but earnest desire. From the depths of the wilderness, the psalmist cries out to Yahweh that he is pining and thirsting for him, that his flesh is longing as a parched desert, lifeless and waterless. He longs to gaze upon his Lord and to experience his power and glory, a perfect and appealing description of what it is like to have grown in prayer to this point of a strong yearning for God. The longest of the Psalms returns to this refrain in expressions that will touch any person who has entered the nights explained by St. John of the Cross. With my whole heart I seek you. I am overcome with incessant longing. I am worn out waiting for you to save me. I open my mouth panting for you. I long for you, my Savior. Isaiah expresses it well as he prays to his Lord, At night my soul longs for you, and my spirit in me seeks for you. Biblical writers were well aware of the phenomena we now describe as a dark fire of purifying contemplation. Absorption in God one might summarize these biblical descriptions of advanced prayer by considering them as complementary aspects of an immersion in God, an absorption in the Beloved. For the saint of the old dispensation, as for the saint of the new, the heart of the human enterprise is nothing other than a being filled with the divine, a being transformed into God himself, a participation in the divine nature. Mary is portrayed by Luke as a woman whose primary and typical occupation is pondering the word in her heart. For Jesus, the Father is like a powerful magnet to which he is continually drawn, and so he habitually goes off for long periods of protracted absorption in the Father, even throughout whole nights. The infant church immediately after the ascension of her Lord groups herself around his mother and spends so much time absorbed in God that Luke terms the prayer continual. Not surprisingly, they are soon filled with the Holy Spirit. The absorption is so satisfying that the psalmist says of it that he delights in nothing else, and St. Paul considers all else to be rubbish. Overflowing Filling Immersion in God entails a being filled with him, a divine inflowing. Biblical men knew well enough that this self-communication of God is the sole destiny of men. The psalmist took it for granted that Yahweh lovingly gives him life, and he declared that everyone is to feast on the bounty of the divine house and to see light in the divine light. St. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was that they know the fullness of God's love, and nothing less. It is clear, therefore, that what we now call infused contemplation and mystical prayer was so well known in biblical times that it was taken for granted. Teresa and John, together with Augustine and Gregory of Nyssa long before them, invented nothing new. They have simply expressed in their own ways and with rich elucidations what we have long had in the deposit of revelation. <clears throat> A contemporary formulation. Despite the fact that both scripture and our saints are clear in their descriptions of what a deep communion with God 
actually is, it may be helpful to cast the whole matter into contemporary language and, at the same time, to add some supplementary observations. Infused contemplation is the normal, ordinary development of discursive prayer. The former gradually and gently replaces the latter when reasoned thought has run its course as a method of communing with the Lord. Infused prayer is given, not produced. Unlike oriental states of awareness, our prayer is a love communion that the Divine Beloved Himself gives when we are ready for it. Hence, we may say that our contemplation is a divinely originated, general, non-conceptual, loving awareness of God. At times, this is a delightful, loving attention, at times a dry, purifying desire, at other times a strong thirsting for Him. In the beginnings, it is usually delicate and brief, but as it develops, it becomes burning, powerful, absorbing, prolonged. Always it is transformative of the person. If all goes well, it eventually culminates in the transforming union itself. The details of this growth in depth we shall consider when we deal with St. Teresa's seven mansions in our next chapter. For now, it may be sufficient to note several traits that are common to all infused contemplation. 1. There is an experience of God's presence either after the manner of a peaceful, general, loving attention or of a dry reaching out for Him. 2. One experiences a great deal of fluctuation in the intensity of this communion and in the diverse manners in which God makes himself felt and known. 3. In advancing contemplation, God gradually and slowly captures the inner faculties. He first occupies the will, and then the imagination and the intellect. This is why in the beginnings of infused prayer, distractions are common. Only the will is taken over. Later on, during deep absorptions and ecstatic prayer, these distractions cease. This capturing is termed the ligature by some writers. In few, four, infused prayer is produced modo divino, in the divine manner, whereas discursive meditation was modo umano, in the human manner. Five, the contemplation itself is dark, that is, without images or concepts. God, who is endlessly beyond all finite ideas and formulations, is now known in a superior way, surpassing all our reasonings and thoughts. This prayer is neither vision, nor locution, nor feeling. 6. The prayer cannot be figured out or understood. Trying to dissect or analyze it by clear, concise ideas or concepts not only issues in frustration, but also indicates a lack of understanding of what contemplation is. 7. There is in Christic contemplation a gradual lengthening of the time span during which the infusion lasts. In the beginnings, the awareness is very brief and is punctured by frequent distractions. But as the years go by, and if one's living of the gospel keeps pace, what God gives increases not only in intensity, but also in duration. Even so, the principle of fluctuation mentioned in number two above is still operative. 8. While the beginnings of infused prayer appear utterly normal and cause no apprehension, later strong prayer gifts can trigger fear as a first reaction. 
It is not the beauty of the gift that begets the fear, but unfamiliarity with it. One wonders what it is and whence it comes. Once assured that its origin is divine, the recipient loses his initial fear. 9. Deepening communion with the indwelling Trinity brings with it a steadily progressive growth in holiness, humility, love, patience, purity, fortitude, and all the virtues. So necessary is this trait that a gradual increase in day-to-day gospel living is an indispensable sign of the genuineness of any prayer. From their fruits, you will know them. Thus ends the reading for chapter 5, What is Contemplation? Such a powerful chapter. It, of itself, contains so much information, so desperately missing, absent, lacking in today's formations and programs. Um, Quick, get the guitars. Quick, raise the volume on the amp. Quick, let's do a rosary congress. Quick, let's get the best preachers and teachers. Hooray, we have 800 people coming, 1,000, 2,000. Where is this knowledge? I hope that this video and the series that I hope to release, these Catholic classics of spirituality, will aid in pouring the foundation for the new move of God that he has planned. To raise the bar for what's considered standard Catholic formation and to enable and equip the saints to more readily and obviously shine forth with the divine life that is within them, within us, within you and I. May God bless you, God love you, God's peace to you. Please pray for me as I pray for you.